Hello and welcome to Stowe Talks, a podcast designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all of the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law. And today we are joined by Tom Nash, aka Mr Divorce Coach, a specialist divorce, separation and family coach to look at the support that is available for male victims of domestic abuse. Hi, Tom. Welcome back to the podcast. Lovely to see you all again. So you were on series one last time. I was indeed. Thank you for having me back. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's really great to have you back. For um, those that are new to the podcast or haven't listened to episode one and should say if you haven't listened to the first episode with Tom, you should probably really go back and listen to that one because it was a really good one. Do you want to just introduce yourself and give us a bit of your background? Yeah, uh, so hi everyone. I'm Tom Nash, otherwise known as Mr. Divorce Coach. Um, I am UK's premier male divorce coach, uh, so I'm proactively trying to change, bring more men to the fold. Uh, my remit is working in, uh, and collaborating alongside family lawyers, mediators, etc., uh, in, in terms of supporting the client's emotional mindset and practical needs. Great. So um, last time you were here, we were talking lots about co-parenting and we got a bit of a different focus today. So we're talking about something which doesn't get explicitly addressed a huge amount. So we're going to have a session on supporting male victims of domestic abuse. So, um, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll come back to kind of why it isn't quite so prominent and the specific things that make it different for male victims of domestic abuse as opposed to female victims of domestic abuse. But should we start with the kind of headline stuff of when we're talking about domestic abuse and specifically with male victims? What, what are we talking about, Tom? Well, it could be, I think domestic abuse can sometimes get confused with traditional, let's say, domestic violence, and they just assume that therefore it's physical. And and that's not just related to men, that's gender specific, any uh, non-gender specific anyway. But I think it's also just looking at what are all the different types and variants uh, of any form of abuse. So you've obviously got any kind of physical abuses um, in terms of physical harm, bruisings and, and, and things like that, or physical contact. But you've also then got a lot of the other uh, ones, signs that are a lot harder to spot um, in terms of things like uh, financial or economic abuse and control, in terms of controlling the family income. One person has all of the all of the capital and assets, and one has all of the has maybe all of the debt or no control, and therefore is maybe given things like pocket money and things like that. So they're quite restricted in terms of their financial uh, opportunities. But then you start to move into things like verbal. Uh, abuse uh, in terms of belittling, um, talking down, or the obvious kind of shouting, swearings, etc. Um, but very systematic and consistent. It is it, it's done in a way to denigrate and, and, and reduce that person so that, they, that the abuser can take on that control. And then, of course, you have things like psychological uh, and emotional control uh, as well. So very much things like and we'll probably get a bit further into them, but things like gaslighting, embarrassing, uh, very manipulative behaviour, putting that person down so that they then believe it themselves as well, a very humiliating, criticising uh, types of approach as well in terms of that emotional abuse. So it, it's just looking at all the kind of different types of abuse as well, not just assuming that abuse automatically means something physical. Yeah, and I think that's something that people sometimes still struggle with, whether we're talking about female victims or male victims I think when we when we and I, I guess that's the change isn't it from using the term domestic violence to domestic abuse is trying to make people understand that it is much more of an umbrella term and it yeah. includes so many different types of um, of behaviors and some are very nuanced and very difficult to perhaps see at first glance so when we're talking about male victims of domestic abuse in particular, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that they are less likely to speak about it. I mean, we talk about this with male mental health um, and yeah. the difference between um, how women and men um, talk about these things and how willing they are to speak about problems that they're going through. So I guess that's going to be an issue, isn't it? That they, they, They're not as likely as women to talk to somebody else about it. So what are the kind of headline stats with male domestic abuse? Yeah, I mean, things are starting to positively change in that respect. Um, and it's through things like this, isn't it? These conversations and talking about these taboo topics and getting it out there. But um, in terms of kind of some broad line statistics, um, it's around about one in three uh, reported 
uh, cases of, uh, of domestic abuse in any of those factors that we were just talking about. One in, it's estimated that one in three um, uh, victims of domestic abuse are male. But like I say, that is on the basis of what's been reported. And I think what's probably more indicative of where maybe where that true figure probably lies uh, is actually that, again, various different studies, and we can share all the links with these, but um, men are, are three times less likely to tell anybody, whether that be informal friend, family, or, or even authorities. Um, we're actually 50%, men are 50% less likely than our female counterparts reported to a, a figure of authority, a GP, the police, etc. So I think that where it says that that stat is around one in three, and I was looking the other day, I think the um, Office of National Statistics, I can never say that, the ONS report, uh, for March to March 2022 was 1.7 million cases across England and Wales, of which just under, I think it's just below 700,000 um, were, were men. But again, that's of the reported cases. And I think that's the kind of key here is that because we are far more likely to, to, to or less likely, sorry, to report it, that the true figure that sits out there is somewhat skewed. Yeah. So it's a huge number. I mean, and, you know, as someone who comes across it in, in practice, is you know, those sort of figures take me by surprise, let alone I think, you know, the average kind of person in the street would be probably really shocked by that because a lot of the, the language around domestic abuse is quite gendered uh, and there are a lot of assumptions there. Um, is there a specific type of abuse that men tend to be victim to more frequently than others or is it broadly the same across the different categories? Uh, broadly, typically you can have any kind of experiences across that, it depends what's going on in the uniqueness of the relationships. I would say just for, from in my professional experience of the clients that I have worked with, um, I have typically seen more of a, a psychological, emotional uh, or possibly even verbal abuse than I have seen of, of a physical. It has been more of the, the process of that manipulation that if you do this or if you don't do this, this is what I will do. Typically related to either finances, children, those, those kind of big immediate fears that all people have when they're going through a potential relationship, breakup or separation, of divorce. Um, but those are kind of typically what I see in terms of the, the, the tools that have, uh, have been weaponized, if you like, in that way to manipulate and to control the situation um, and to, to denigrate that person and, and pull them into a place where they are less than they feel that they can be and that therefore the abuse can take that control. But there's, there's various other studies that are going on around that at the moment, uh, but it is what I typically see is, is that psychological, uh, emotional and verbal. And what sort of effect does this have on them? A huge one. There's actually, um, I was at a talk recently with a, a fantastic dance charity called Dance Unlimited. And the chap from there, one of the, the CEO, was actually talking about um, some research that's being done, I think, in line with some, some universities at the moment around the direct impact and correlation between men's mental health and separation and divorce, particularly when it comes to the experiences of, of, of all these different forms of uh, domestic abuse, and the direct correlation that that actually has on men's mental health typically, but also the direct impacts it actually has to um, suicide. Men are 80% more likely to commit suicide than women, and it's the single biggest killer of men under 50, 55 in the UK. Um, and there, there's going to be a direct correlation there. Um, so it's, it's all these contributing factors are huge, huge, scary things and huge, scary figures. And again, like we say, going back to the first point, this is only based on what's reported. Mm. Yeah, I mean, those figures are really scary, aren't they? Why do you think it is that men don't feel that they can talk about this? And what is it that they could do or what is it that we could do, I suppose, to open up those conversations even more? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any kind of one magic one that will fix everything. I think it's a combination of a, a, a variety of things. Um, and those will be kind of cultural, social impacts, um, workplaces, loads of different things that we can do and opportunities. And I think, like I say, these conversations talk more, but typically the things that, that hold men back is things like stigma and stereotyping, right? Those, uh, we should be stronger. You should not man up those type of statements, which, which I don't subscribe to, but that assumption that actually we should be able to cope with this um, or people making statements of, well, he's a big strapping level and he should be fine, but you, you don't know what's going on in that situation for them and how that's impacting them. So again, that can actually stigmatize it even further. There's a huge amount of things if we're talking around like the um, emotional and subconscious impacts as well, 
Uh, and again, this is both for, 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 for men and for women, but we're obviously just talking about the guys here for a minute, of where uh, like those stress and those fears of isolation, um, that fear and that shame, that guilt that coming up, self-blame as well. This is my fault. I should, I, why have I let this happen? Right. So there's things like that. So there's a lot of emotional distress. The self-esteem, self-worth, self-value, self-belief, all the, the foundations of which confidence are built on have been absolutely decimated. So again, we're not feeling strong enough um, and not feeling that we're strong enough or we're perceived to be um, or it's portrayed in that way. One of the other key things that become quite a big challenge, and this is for, for, for all victims of abuse, um, is that typically their support network has been decimated. They're very isolated. They have been, in effect, forced people into a situation where their friends, family, connections, their interactions, their social network um, is, is, is effectively been eradicated. Um, so they're very distant, very isolated. They've got very few, if any, people to open up to um, and to reach out to. Um, and, and again, that's quite a typical trait of an abuser is systematically removing those support pillars for somebody. Um, so again, that can potentially be sometimes sort of a reason they don't know who to go to. I think the other big thing, particularly more so for men, is that statistically and previously, and there have been quite a few instances about this in the press as well, um, is where the uh, men have previously not felt strong enough to go to the authorities because they don't think they, they don't feel like they will be believed. Um, again, that they should have been able to... Well, sometimes they can feel like, oh, well, they're, they're not going to be believed because actually they should have been able to deal with this um, or it's not quite as bad as, as it should be and they should be fine. There is a lot of change going on, but I think there's still about some imbalances of support, if you like. Um, there was a, there was an instance that you remember to, it was a couple of years ago where, and again, this was well documented in the, in the media, um, of, a, of a chap, a, a domestic abuse survivor, who had contacted, didn't feel like he could go anywhere else, I can't remember if it was police or GP that hadn't taken on what he'd said. And even when he actually called, he couldn't find at the time a men's um, a domestic abuse line. And he called a particular refuge line, a line to, to, to female support. And, for, and he was told that he wasn't, that they didn't have funding, they didn't know how to support. So again, I think that imbalance of support, that, that is starting to change. I think the other big things is, is, is language, you know, changing that language, both informally, legally, etc. all those things, again, I can't comment on that, that's, you, that's for you guys to say. Um, but I think that that can have a big impact on how things change. I think I think the language point's really interesting. I think there's a lot of problems with sort of societal structures and expectations. And, you know, you, you talked about man up, you know, grow a pair, boys don't cry. And, and that general sort of, you know, it, it, it feeds into toxic masculinity, doesn't it? And the expectations that society or men feel that society have of them to be male to be masculine to be all these all these things i mean how pervasive is that and is that that sounds like it feels to me that that's such a huge problem in in preventing men from opening up about things like this but also in general about mental health you know there is an epidemic of men's mental health and and, and men are just fundamentally a bit crap about talking about it a lot of the time um and i think a lot of it comes from that doesn't it it does. And I think what we're also starting to see, and again, one thing that I think is, if anything, positive come from the pandemic and lockdowns is that conversations about mental health, everybody's, we all have it, whether it's good, just like physical health, and it can be good and bad and we need to work on it. And I think that conversations where people just generally acknowledge and talk about mental health now and appreciate that everybody can have their good days and their bad days. And I think you're absolutely right. Those changes of language, but then also how we then carry it on. Like, again, like you were just saying about how, men and us guys are, are typically pretty bad at opening up and talking about mm. stuff. It's, we're actually not, but actually it's about the approach to it. And I think when we're afforded that space and that opportunity in the right way, it's, it's quite easy. And you, it's quite easy, but we've, probably a lot of us have witnessed this, where actually it can be like a sound bite of information when you ask a guy like if they're okay. You're like, oh, like, how you doing, Matt? And it can be like, whether it's, I don't know, walking the dog or in the pub, whatever it is, and it can be the short sound bite part about, well, yeah, no, I'm all right, but I'm just annoyed about this but you know what it'll, it'll, it'll figure itself out or whatever it might be and we brush it off and actually if we then start going into those conversations a bit deeper and actually helping to people to open up about them and go well actually do you want to talk about that a bit more what's really going on or if it's deflective as well like hey doing you okay yeah, yeah i'm fine okay hey how are you really doing what's going on what's that thing like if you're no especially if you're reading someone you know what you know some of their their non-verbal cues as well right what's really going on for them giving them that space reminding them that you're always there 
um, and that it can come to you any time. But you're absolutely right. It's about changing that approach to things, uh, changing that mindset, changing those conversations. And But guys do open up. I mean, purely by default, not by design, but my client base is around 70-30 split men to women because right? typically I'm one of the few guys around that does this. Um, but I can tell you, men, men do talk. Guys do talk. And they want somewhere to go to and they need to know that actually it's okay for them to open up about their things. It's okay for them to start understanding like that in these situations that we're talking about um victims of abuse that they're not to blame they're not weak they're not alone there is support there's growing support and there are spaces for them to go yeah it's interesting and you started to touch upon there some of the telltale signs if you like that we should perhaps be looking out for um in our male family members friends work colleagues i guess red flags I suppose, yeah. is, is the term for it. So, you know, you talked about them being perhaps, um, you know, asking those questions, how are you, and then digging a bit deeper. But are there any other red flags that we could we could be watching out for? Yeah, there, there's, there's loads. I and mean, honestly, the, the list is kind of endless. It's about how you recognise and understand the individual. But if you're starting to see, like, quite typical ones where their behaviours are very changing um, in terms of, they're becoming quite quiet, quite timid, where they weren't once quite as uh, as quiet and timid. They might be quite steeped in self blame, so they it's everything is their fault. It's a deflection process, so they take on all of that. It's a conditioned thought process for them as well. Um, and again, that also becomes a bit of a protective nature, uh, both for them as well as for the abuser, so they don't get any more abuse because then they take on the blame, so it's their fault. Very, uh, very low self worth and self uh, self belief, self esteem. Um, you might notice that their uh, work behaviours or how they're showing up at work changes, or their social interactions and things like that. That maybe loss of identity. Like a, I've had it a lot where people have said to me that like a former shell of oneself. That like you can see that there's a, a big change in someone. Are their behaviours becoming more kind of dependent or codependent to their spouse and things like that? Are they regressing and becoming isolating from friends, family, early signs of alienating behaviours as well? Maybe are their um, are their are their children changing how they're interacting with them as well? Are we seeing things like um, increased panic, potential panic attacks, and anxieties, uh, other kind of behavioural shifts? So th there's a whole host of different things. I think it's just looking at that person that you maybe know and are witnessing from afar, and just seeing that there's maybe some emotional distress signals, maybe that regulation around emotional controls and things like that so are they also potentially um very negative self-talk again where they probably weren't weren't before um and, and again actually the, the way that they talk about themselves has very much changed and you can start to see that actually that's not how they used to talk about themselves that sounds like that's something that has been a, a programmed uh, kind of language pattern for them in a way that they've taken on so there's a whole host of different ones, but I think it's more of an you just seeing those changes in how somebody was to where you see them now. There might be a series of these that are all systematically working together um, that could be different signs to spot with someone. So if you've spotted some of those red flags or you're concerned about somebody, whether, as I say, colleague, family member, friend, and you said that men will, they will speak, but often they don't. How do we create that safe space? How do we make it so that they feel that they can talk to us or talk to somebody else about it? Yeah, I think you've got to, I think the key point there is about a safe space and what is a safe space? Because a lot of people talk around a safe space, but what is that, right? At, at the minute, if they're in a situation where they don't feel safe enough to talk about it, is that their mindset or is it the physical setting and the environment they're in? Do we need to create a physical space for them? Um, is that places potentially within the workplace or with family and friends and the, hopefully the network that they still have but just looking at what creates and makes them feel safer what helps them feel that they are secure because you've got to remember that their their default setting here is, a, is around fear any of this comes out and they're going to feel the repercussions of that in, in in various different ways and shapes and forms so how can you ensure that actually you are providing that space because they're going to be quite reticent as well to come forward potentially especially if you're kind of instigating that. So it's how could you take that approach? There are various charities out there. I think we're going to be signposting to a few 
um, anyway, ones like um, Mankind, um, there's a, a men's advice line and various others. But go and have a look at and get educated around what do the charities say? What, what's the best ways to create these spaces? Helping them to think about things like, and again, not enforcing it straight away because there's going to be a lot of fear there, but how could you help them to understand when they're ready things like a safe exit strategy, right? Places they can go, people they can call upon, what do they need to think about? Because they're not going to be in the right mindset and prepared for knowing what they need to do. Another just regular check-ins, are you okay? Right? Don't give up on them. Even if you feel like someone is pulling away and being distant from them, but you're concerned that this isn't actually their decision, that this is actually being a construct for them, right? you can always still be there. Right? You can always still be available, just dropping in. The other thing is if you um, are you are be able to get to the conversations where you can start to instigate this with them, starting to create things like safe words, safe sentences. Um, again, something that if they can text you that, doesn't give it give it away the game or anything like that because again they, they might be very much living in fear um so it's how do we create those free spaces for them how do we ensure that there's no judgment there that we just listen and acknowledge for them um one of the big things that we also tend to do especially because we want to kind of wrap our arms around our nearest and dearest is we can't over promise to them as well there is um there is a statistic, and I can't remember where this one comes from now, it will come to me later on, um, but there is a statistic that it takes a victim on, on average seven attempts to leave an abuser before they leave for the last time. Now, those attempts can be quite small ones where they actually just go out for the day, or it could be quite a big one that they actually do leave, but then come back. Um, so again, always being available. That's what I'm saying, don't overpromise. just create that space. And, and I suppose that, 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 that comes with that is, is an understanding that, I've known abuse victims being judged quite harshly by friends and family for not leaving or for returning or, or whatever. And understanding that psychology of the difficulty in escaping an abuser, it can be really, really key because if you end up sort of criticising someone for going back, then that's going to shrink the world even further if the victim then feels it's always oh, my fault and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And th th there's so many other things that are going on for them in terms of where their headspace is at, right? Particularly if they've got children, for example, right? Because that could be a, a huge fear. I, mean, I know as a divorced dad, that was a huge fear and I wasn't in, or, or wasn't in, an, in an abusive relationship. And even that was a big fear for me around, am I going to see my children? Can I see them? When will I see them? So if you're the victim of, of, a, of an abuser as well, that will typically more often than not come into play and be used as one of those things. So, you're absolutely right. You've got things like panic. You've got um, you're going to see signs of kind of uh, PTSD, post traumatic uh, uh, stress there as well. Potential depressions, of course, and things like that. There was a study that was going on. As I'm looking at this the other day, a couple of weeks ago, there was a study because um, you were saying about understanding the psychology of it, of where this can come from and the kind of chemical imbalances. And I think it was done by UCLA. Um, they were talking about one of the things that happens is how and where the oxytocin, the love drug, the love chemical comes from. And it's where it's being released. And actually that, whilst it's seen as the love drug, right, um, or the love drug within you, the only chemical balance, it's where it's coming from. And when it comes from one particular area, that's actually around a positive social bond, right? When it comes from a, a stress response receptor, that actually goes into that panic and lockdown. So you've got to remember, if you're thinking about it in that context, you're saying that, per that person's going back and then they're dealing with all of that. You're dealing actually with their stress responses. They're trying to protect themselves in the only way that they feel that they can. So again, always still not judging them, having that space, knowing that they're there, taking them seriously, offering assurances is a, is a, is a huge thing. Yeah, I think um, there's obviously, you've, you've gone through really helpfully a lot of traits that you can see in abuse victims but sometimes it might be that the traits are no, there are noticeable traits in the abuser now most abuse happens behind closed doors so it's not often easy to see this but i certainly have experienced clients of mine or people i've known tell me things about their relationship that makes me go hang on that that feels like a red flag to me and perhaps they hadn't realized because people don't always realize they're being abused. So I wonder that, you know, do you have a, a you know, are there sort of um, traits that might come out in conversation that, that you can pick on and say to your brother, you know, friend, whatever, actually you might want to think a bit further about this. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, and that does come on all the time. And I'm sure it comes up for you guys as well, where you spot those signs. And there's, because like you say, it's going to happen behind closed doors. But when someone maybe starts to share that information mm. with you, it's about starting to unpick them, but understand the context and the ecology with it, with it, with, with it, which within they've happened. Um, but looking at what's quite manipulative behaviours, so things like gaslighting. Um, so is that is that person being convinced otherwise that of, of what they believe to be true is actually not that left is right and up is down, right? Looking at uh, things like does their spouse have zero accountability or self-reflection? Now, that doesn't mean that they don't apologise. In fact, actually, a lot of abusers do apologise a lot but that a bit like um, with uh, a young child who's maybe just saying sorry because they, they don't want to get told off and they want to calm it down. It has similar kind of approaches to that. So abusers do actually apologise, but they still have zero accountability for change and behaviour, actually changing how they are and what they're doing. Is there actually any congruency behind those apologies? Um, you've obviously got things like ultimatums. If you do or don't do A, B, C, right? Uh, that they, those can be quite a typical uh, uh, abuser trait. Someone's picking fights and faults over every little thing. Right? And again, it's used as a way to belittle, to denigrate, to pull that person down, to humiliate them. Um, guilt trips is quite an obvious one as well, because the, the abuser has to load on all that weight to the victim. And again, these are, these are all systematic in their approach to make that person feel this small so that they can control them, you know, forces their feelings onto and makes it theirs, you know, make them very subservient um, and obedient. So it's very much like their way, their way or the highway and things like that. So there's, there's a whole host of different traits that you might see, but they're going to be quite systematic. And again, if you're just noticing these signs when you're speaking to your, and again, we're, we're talking about male victims here, so it could be, your dad, it could be your brother, it could be your uncle, it could be your, like, there's a whole, uh, you may know somebody in this situation and it's how well you know them and if you're spotting a kind of systematic of those behaviours that are actually contributing to how they're being impacted, what changes are happening in them of the, of the behaviours that you see. So we, you talked a little bit, I mean, you've seen, perhaps we've seen some of the red flags, perhaps in, you know, the male victim or indeed the abuser, and you talked a bit about having an exit strategy a little while ago. Um, can you go through that with us perhaps in a little bit more detail as to the things that can be done when these flags are seen? Yeah, when you've got, so if you've got somebody that's in front of you and either they have begun to recognise that or you have assisted them to help to recognise this, there's various different things. One is, again, safely keeping some kind of log and journal about what is going on any kind of, and that's names, dates, places where it happened, witnesses, what was said, anything like that. Um, again, reporting to uh, your GP or, or, or to the police as well. But in terms of the, the actual exit strategy, it's thinking around where can you go? Where can you go that is safe and neutral? Somewhere that you know you can be protected and shut down. That person is not going to come and turn up on the door and come and find you. Right? Sometimes it might be that your immediate kind of thought of go-to might actually be the first place they go to. So you've got to have something safe and a place to go and people to call upon and places to be able to go. Some of the real basic things as well is around having some clothes, some money, is there any documents that you might need to keep, marriage certificates, birth certificates, insurances, things like that. Like it has, if you think about those manipulative behaviours of an abuser, I have witnessed this before, um, where um, some uh, the, the abuser then changed all of the insurance documents and things like that, so that the victim actually then got pulled over by the police because they're driving around uninsured and things like that. Right, so is it a bank statements, passports? Importantly, if you're if, if you have children, young children, are the children going with you? Yeah. So there's a, a, a lot around what makes it a safe exit and also that, that real point about it being safe is how do you prepare and protect yourself in the meantime as well how do you ensure that actually you've i, I, I had a client once before who ended up having to get a spare kind of a spare phone and new email address and all these different bits and bobs and leave them with a particular friend that was very very disconnected from anybody else in fact it was a very it was an old distant friend 
um, who they've purposely reached out to because they identified I need someone very disconnected from all of this. Um, so the various different things to think about and it's not just leaving straight away sometimes because actually that, that, that can sometimes be the worst thing because maybe you need to build up to and protect yourself as well and make sure that you've got everything in place beforehand um, to ensure to ensure that also that you then don't have to go back because that's what we were talking about before isn't it when people can go back yeah it's really interesting actually that you use the word journaling um, and I don't know about you Matt but when clients come in and we're talking about potentially um, abuse that has been or they're worried about one of the first things that I'll say is, is that you need to keep notes um, of dates, times, exactly what's happened. I've never used the term journaling before, though, and it almost feels that like that's a safer term to use. It feels a bit less, um, it feels a little bit less confronting, a little bit, to to just say yeah. that I'm going to write a journal rather than I'm going to write notes on what the other party's doing. Um, yeah. But it's really helpful because, you know, if we have to make applications for injunctions or something along those lines, um, it's really difficult to remember everything that's happened. And it can be, like you say, it can be quite nuanced. It can be quite, it can be a pattern of things rather than one particular incident. And having, being able to just go back through a journal, go back through notes and, and have it all there makes certainly makes our job a lot easier. Yeah, I think it's also about how you do it as well, because different things for different people. You know? Some people are more visual learners and so on and so forth. So you're absolutely right. I, I very rarely would say like document, because it, it, again, it can feel quite formulaic and quite corporate. Um, and so for different people, I might say to journal, keep a bit of a diary, even could you just drop down, uh, could you just drop down a, a, a little log, just like just each day? update that i mean you can even put down when things don't happen right so again you can keep a track of how systematic these things are mm. i had a i had a client not too long ago who works within um the kind of their professional area of expertise is within um uh, accounting uh, and finance um their world is spreadsheets right that's how they operate um so they chose to keep their log on their spreadsheets and it was a safe document that they stored somewhere else offline with a separate email and everything else so again just making sure because I hope that's the other thing you've got to remember. If you're using any form of tech, it can either be helpful or it can be a hindrance. So make sure that you are not on things like a family cloud or backing up to anything like that. Okay, because unfortunately that that, that that can I've witnessed that before as well. But like I said, that particular chap, he was using spreadsheet for somebody else. They were more of a handwriter, so they wanted to write things down in their notes. Um, I did have one client who used to use a, a, a transcriber app and it would email it to their new and private own private email that nobody else knew about um, so that they could actually just walk around and talk about it. Um, I did have another client who actually just used to dictate that to a friend who would note that down for them. They're all really great practical tips and I think um, you've touched on a couple of other things there that maybe it's a good time to plug some of the other podcast episodes so there's a couple in particular so uh, the one domestic abuse how can the family lawyer help that goes into Lisa just mentioned injunctions things like non-molestation orders and occupation orders. That's me and Lisa talking about what needs to be done for those and really the, the journaling, log, whatever we're going to call it. And I agree that terminology is probably more helpful than making notes and something for me to reflect on. Um, specificity is really important there. Um, you know, uh, when you can talk about incidents or times or patterns of behaviour or, uh, you know, and really draw those out. Um, something else is, is you just referenced... Um, uh, tech, which can be incredibly tricky. We did um, a, a, a podcast on, on tech abuse as well. So, you know, that understanding and dealing with tech abuse, they're both on the Stowe Talks feeds. So do check those out for a lot more detail in those areas to, to help people. But I think those are some really good practical tips that you've given Tom, with great issue spotting and things. Um, what about signposting? This may be a good point to kind of, to leave this, someone's listened to all this, is, you know, and there's lots of red flags you know maybe where can people signpost to other resources and you know it'd be great to then finish with your sort of top couple of tips for both someone who's experiencing domestic abuse or if you're worried that a male friend a male you know colleague or friend or family member of yours is experiencing domestic abuse cool. yeah I think we, we mentioned a few signposting earlier so there's, there's mankind.org.uk um, and you also have something called the Men's Advice Line, which again, I think is .org.uk from memory. Also have a look at other local groups as well, that maybe not necessarily specifically focused just at abuse, 
but again, they may have additional signposting opportunities within that. And actually, I've had a couple of clients who have found that actually that's been more around, actually, this is a local dad's group or whatever it might be, or a local men's uh, support group, uh, mental health support group, or just a general local guys group, like a golfing one or something like that, that comes under that. So I know that, that there's various of them popping up that are online, that are in person. There's uh, one or two that are local to me, for example, that's called Four Men's Talk. Um, have a look for things like that because they themselves can also then be that conduit and that vehicle towards the other wider supports that you might be able to find. I think the other really important thing is if you do feel safe to do so, speak to the police, speak to your GP, not just once, right? If you need to keep going back and keep having these conversations as well, because you may need to be showing a systematic of these uh, 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 experience that's been going on. If you are ever in danger, of course, just calling 999 and reaching out to the police immediately. But there are various other professionals, whether it be coaches, therapists, counsellors, um, reaching out to things like the Samaritans. Um, uh, there's a couple of other dance charities as well. I think I mentioned one earlier, Dads Unlimited and things like that, that also run talks and so on and so forth with things like this. And I, I think that's some of the things that outside of that direct support other people, if you're, you're asking about tips and things like that, that you can do both directly and indirectly, one of the things that I would say is go get educated. If you feel that your your friend, your brother, whatever it might be, might be in a situation, go get yourself educated. Go and speak to some charities. Could you also provide some time, money, resources to these charities to help widen that message, to help widen that level of support, to help edu educate others, um, share and normalise these conversations so that people that are in those situations, that are those victims, can feel safer because the more that we talk about these things the wider room and wider coverage it has and the more safe people will feel about coming out to people and talking to them um i think if you are the abuse uh, if, if you're the victim uh, if you're being abused in this situation in terms of top tips wise is uh, i kind of mentioned it earlier you are not to blame you are not alone this is not your fault there are resources out there you're not weak right people are there to help you Find the people that you feel safest with, even if you haven't spoken to them for a long time and you felt they're isolated. I promise you they're waiting for, the, for your call. They care and they want to hear from you. That's great. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. And um, as Matt said, lots lots for us to reflect on as well. Lots of lots of, you know, really insightful information within there. So I guess just to reiterate, if you need support with domestic abuse, you can contact the Mankind Initiative at mankind.org.uk or call 01823 334 244. So that's it for this episode of Stow Talks. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about all the work that Tom does supporting people going through a relationship breakdown at his website, mrdivorcecoach.co.uk. Tom also offers all interested parties a free 45-minute consultation, which you can book via his website or via any of his social media feeds. Just search Mr Divorce Coach. If you would like more information on our podcasts, head over to stotalks.co.uk and please rate, like, share and review this podcast where you can. Ooh.